Hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Biff Rugby League podcast. First of all, apologies for the lack of a podcast like last week and the lack of social media interaction. I was really unwell for, for three days and I didn't let the lads know until the Tuesday morning that I wasn't very well when I got sent home from work. Um, we forgot to do predictions. We just, we just basically, we've had a week off and we've had a little chat. So we won't see us next week. You'll see us in two weeks and then two weeks again after that we're gonna we're gonna change the way we run the show a little bit we're gonna change the amount of times that we produce content for you so that we can increase the quality of what we're providing for you guys to listen to and to watch at home while you're chilling out having a bath walking to work whatever you do when you listen and watch to watch us before we go into some of the deep content that we're going to talk about today how have you two been how was your how was your nap toby yeah, no, I, uh, oh, I, I've managed to have a nap and oversleep so that when we start recording this podcast, which means I should be ready to go <laughs> and my imagination should be running wild ahead of this podcast because I'm still in dreamland, so, uh, get a new sort there, then. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting a little bit new structure to the show, feeling more positive about it, let's go. Let's go, he loves it. Robin, how, you, how have you been? How's your, how have you taken the rest? It's good, yeah. We, I mean, we, we're pushing the boundaries here, aren't we? We're that close to the limit that we need. We literally have to rest five minutes before we start. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to catching up with you boys again. That's all I'd like to see. I mean, Robin's completely frozen on Discord. We can hear him, but for some reason, he, he has oh. he's frozen. He's just sat there smiling really creepily. Um, but it's been good. <laughs> it's been nice to just sort of chill out, watch the first week of the NRL without having to worry about sort of reviewing what's happened. We will go into it a little bit in a bit and sort of which which players impressed us but I suppose we should kick off with the story of the round and I'll, I'll throw it straight to you Robin what's what's yeah. what's stood out for you this week or the last in the last fortnight in the world of rugby league yeah so um, obviously round one of the NRL uh, and one of one of our own stole the headlines um, and that was Dom Young playing for Newcastle um, he helped his side pull off a, an upset against the Roosters um, and it's, a, it's a quite an interesting path into the NRL, not not the usual route that we see players take. Um, he he was ba- barely made the grade for Newcastle, uh, for Huddersfield, sorry, over in the Super League, uh, and he was just a teenager. And he signed to to an NRL club, um, and, and played over there. Uh, and he managed to score four tries in six games in his first year. That was 2021. And uh, this year, um, Adam O'Brien's given him the the number two jersey for round one, and he helped he helped he helped to win. He was um, he was impressive in defence. Uh, he was up against Daniel Tupou, the the uh, player on the opposite end of his career. He's an experienced vet, but um, he took him on in defence and attack, pulled off a try, uh, a great try a great try saver for the highlight reel um, when they were down to twelve men as well. So he's he's he's. Attracted a lot of attention, um, and you know, there's talk about uh, what he wants to do at the end of this year. He is um, eligible for Jamaica and England. Um, I think his plans probably um, were for Jamaica, but you know, with, with all the hype, he's in the England conversation. And um, I don't know. I, I think he. I think we we liked what we saw. Toby, you put in the chat, didn't you, this week? Dom Young for England. So <laughs> he's he's definitely he's, he's we're on the hype train right now, but. Um, it's just it's just interesting because he is um, so young to be in the NRL. Usually we see um, like English players going over there once they've established themselves in the Super League, um, and so you know we we do produce some some great players. Um, you know you can see why they'd want to go to the NRL. It's it's the top competition. The best players are there. They want to play against the best. Um, it's 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 much bigger in Australia. So if you want if you want the life of you know, celebrity and all that stuff that comes <laughs> with it, then you can go down there and live that. Whereas if you play rugby league over here, you're a nobody. Um, but also there's there's the money, you know, the salary cap in the NRL dwarfs the Super League. So the opportunity to earn big bucks if you go down there. And we should be proud of what we produce down there. You look um, more recently at, at, at Toby's beloved Canberra Raiders and they, they were pushing for a grand final off the back of um, four great English players um back further than that the rabbitos and the burgess brothers and um, we produce loads james graham gareth widdop they're all they're all fantastic players in their own right in the nrl um and 
it only makes our international side stronger that these players can develop their skills in a tough competition. But there is a downside to that, and that and it, it and the truth is that we lose our best players or a majority of our best players at the peak of their careers, and it's a shame because Super League's worse off for it. Um, the the competition has tried to combat with uh, the marquee player rule where the the uh, one player in every club, their salary doesn't count towards the cap, so they basically can spend whatever they want. But that's still only 12 players in the whole competition. So the, it's, it's difficult if you're a top player to, to get that spot and earn the big bucks unless you go down to the NRL. So um, there's, there's pros and cons. You know, it's great for the England team, but week to week in the Super League, we're, we're losing great players. So, um, yeah, an, an interesting little look at the the way the competitions are run. I guess it's always going to happen. It, it happens in all sports, but it just it's it, particularly in rugby league because there's only two competitions. We're kind of the proving ground, and the NRL is the the aspiration. That's where that's when we look at the who when they finish their careers and we say who's the best. If they've not got a, a fantastic NRL record, then then that limits their ability to be in the conversation. One player that I always wish played in, in the NRL is James Roby and he's 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 a St. Helen stalwart, he's a fantastic player and his stats are fantastic um, and he's been at the top of his game so long but he's never tested himself in the NRL we've never seen that side of him and you know it would have been really interesting to see I'm sure he would have been great but we'll never know and that's a shame that that sort of hangs over players that don't try it but yeah, I wonder what you two think. Are we are we hyping up Don Young a bit too early? Do you think that this is something we might see a bit more of, young players trying out their NRL career early, and if it fails, they'll go to Super League anyway? Yeah. What do you think? I, I, looking at the England World Cup squad announcement and looking at what players are available and stuff, and you two, I've said privately to you two who two players in the NRL that if Sean Wen was to pick them, it would severely boost our chances of winning the World Cup. One of them was born in England, one of them isn't born in, wasn't born in England, and is probably going to be on the radar of the Australia team. Though that player is one of those players is Sam Walker, born in Leeds, while his dad was over here playing for the Rhinos, and Victor Radley, like one of the best lock forwards in the world, is probably third or fourth choice in the New South Wales team. Like he's got Cam Murray, Dale Finucane. And um, Jake Travojevic ahead of him for New South Wales at the minute. Like, I know he can play a hooker as well, so you might even find him in shooting into that role. But those those two players, if they're not going to be picked for Jamaica, I think Sean Wayne needs to go, lads, come and play for England. Because in four years' time, you can still play for Australia at the World Cup if you want. Because that's the way the world, that's the way the, the competition works. These teams, they can play for one country and then go and play for another. But I, don't, I think they can still do it in, that, in the four-year cycle. and they, So they can do that. This is, a, this is a list of players in the NRL that can play for England. Bailey Hodgson, his brother Jalen Hodgson, and their cousin Josh, or their uncle Josh Hodgson. Then, to finish off the backs, you've got Dom Young, Herbie Farmworth, and Oliver Gildart that we've already mentioned in previous episodes. Um, another young back at the Gold Coast Titan is Jaden de Groot. He's half, I think he's got a Dutch mother and an English father. So he could play for the Netherlands, Australia, and England. So he's got quite a few choices to make. Jackson Hastings, obviously, in the halves as well. Just played for GB. Forwards, Elliot Whitehead, George and Tom Burgess, Ryan Sutton, Tom, um, Luke Thompson, and then young Harry Rushton, who I believe the Raiders have signed as well. That, that's, a, that's a big pack of players. And Toby mentioned in the chat earlier in, earlier in the day, you can make an England 13 of players just playing in the NRL. Toby, how many of those players that you named in your 13 not Bradley, because you didn't mention him, do you think would start for England in that World Cup? Um, I think it's... That's a hard one to call. Um, I think Dom Young's an interesting player. Um, coming out of last season, I think wasn't that great under the high ball. Um, and, you know, there was a couple of times where defensively he maybe got stood, stood up. He seems to have had a really good pre-season, improved that defensive side of his game. And now I think the only thing well, he showed us um, on the weekend that he's a finisher. I get the ball in his hands. You know he can do your uh, over the corner post tries that Robinson. <laughs> um, uh, I think that the only thing we haven't seen from him is blistering speed um, and agility that perhaps a Tommy Makinson or a uh, um, Tom Johnston brings. Yeah, I see um, that. 
Um, but he's, I, I think he's very much in the mould of um, Jermaine McGilvery, actually, in terms of the sort of physical beast that he can be. Yeah. Um, so I think it comes down to play styles in terms of whether he makes it as a starter in the England squad. But also, I think the chance to have a physical beast, he's been playing against these Australians all season if he stays fit, is probably really needed to be in, in, in or around the squad. Um, I think Oliver Gildart definitely makes the definitely makes the squad. I think defence is such a hard position for England to select. Um, and by that token, Herbie Farmworth depends on the season he has. Mm. Um, he, but if he plays a full season at a win, in a winning Brisbane, even if he doesn't seem to be one of the main pieces helping that team win, yeah, surely you've got to put um, sort of him into the squad. Um, Walker and Hastings, I think it genuinely depends on if they want to play and if, um, or if it's their sort of, you know, what Sean Wayne's philosophy is around selection. Yeah. Um, then Tom Burgess, uh, Tom Burgess and George Burgess um, are interesting ones. I think that's completely dependent on their season. Um, with having Luke Thompson, who will definitely be playing in in yeah. the NRL, and oh, Luke 100%. Thompson. He's being recognised as now as one of the best props in the NRL. He had the most tackles um, in the in the Bulldogs game against the Cowboys. Uh, he had the most fan- fantasy points, as that's a stat which the NRL doesn't care about. Uh, but he also, <laughs> I think, he made 130 metres off 13 carries or something. So, yeah, absolutely monster. He's definitely going to be playing. Um, and then. Elliot Whitehead moves to 13 and shows that he can sort of do the Jake Trevojevic role of ball mm. handling and come in and help in the attack sort of move. Uh, Ryan Sutton will be dependent on his game time. Uh, Josh Hodgson's the one player who I, I, I personally just hope it doesn't get near the England setup. Um, yeah. To be honest, I think he's... I've, I've Two, three seasons, he, he's been a hindrance on Canberra. Uh, the past sort of six, seven seasons, he, it hasn't really worked out for him with England. Uh, he's just been a bit too slow and um, put, not letting England play on the front foot, which is can be quite difficult for an England squad when they're playing a, a bigger pack. Um, so he's the sort of the one player where he might get in on his experience, but I, he's, the, he's the player who I think um, really shouldn't be going. Um, as for that, the rest are sort of young and you know, would have to play a full season, I think, to be able to put their names on, on an England ship this season in terms of Bailey Hodgson and Harry Rushton. Um, yeah. And, and so that that's sort of my breakdown of it. Yeah, you mentioned Hooker there, and you you're thinking Josh Hodgson. You don't want him anywhere near that squad. But we we named some hookers that realistically are are probably in Sean Wayne's plans, and picking the hookers that are in his in his plans. Paul McShane, Cruz Leeming, and uh, the other ones I've gone lost it. Someone help me. I had it in my head. Wire. Um. No, Daryl Clark. Daryl Clark, Cruz Leeming and Paul McShane are the three that I believe Sean Wayne picked in his Super League-based sort of England training squad. Um, we mentioned the fact that if you don't include James Roby in the list of top hookers for the England squad, and that's whether Roby decides to make himself available for selection, we, look, we have very slim pickings at hooker. Is that when Sean Wayne probably needs to go, do I need to get on the phone? Do I need to ring Roby? Do I need to convince Radley? Does Radley need to convince me? Like which way? Like he's already come out and said, "I want English. I want this English team to be English players who want to play for England." He's not going to want. Gonna go, he's not going to go out there and pick Radley just because he can. He wants Radley to prove himself. He wants Sam Walker to prove that he wants to play for England. Does he need to get on the phone to Roby and go, "Can you play this World Cup for us?" I don't know. I don't know. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't like that he's got this idea that it's just going to be our English players that want to play for England. Like who? What, who is he to decide that? If these players want to play for England and they're England eligible, yeah. Why? Why wouldn't you pick them if they're the best, best option? Yeah. Um. I. I don't know. I don't know about Roby. I, there was a. I mean, Daryl Clark. There's a time when I really rated him, but I just think he's pretty average. But at times, I think with Hooker, it's an interesting position where, like, obviously Josh Hodgson's an example of the opposite. But you can kind of get away with an average Hooker and it not make or break your team. Yeah. So a, a dependable Hooker like Clark could be a good option over someone like Hodgson who's just going to slow us down. 
Yeah, don't get me wrong. In my no, opinion, Daryl Daryl Clark is is that number nine shirt is his. But when you, if if he gets an injury, we're quite short. And I think yeah. if he gets a, if he does his ACL touch wood that he won't the next week and he's out for a year, that that number nine shirt looks like a business looks a severely weak point. When you're looking at the Australian nines, you're looking at Brandon Smith for um, for New Zealand as well. There's there's not a lot of depth in that position for us. A player, we've sort of gone off track and we're talking about NRL exports. A player that we kind of, there's a player that you kind of wanted to see, see if, see if they could go and make it in the NRL, wasn't there, Robin? Um, I can't remind me. It's oh, the, Robin. Uh, no, the player of the round. If you... Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you prepared that segue and I completely <laughs> just dropped the ball on that. Dropped the ball. Yeah. There Go is a player that I, I don't know if I'd like to see him in the NRL. Like I say, we, we I don't want to I want to keep him in Super League, but all, at the same time, it would be interesting to see how he went in, in the NRL because he's a very unorthodox player. But yeah, our player of the round this week is <laughs> Jake Connor. I probably could have included him last week as well. He just seems to be hitting his form at the minute. And yeah, it's, um, it's good to see. Yeah, I mean, like near ten try assists and three tries in in like the last three rounds alone, like that. Yeah, he's not maybe scoring, but he got was I think when they scored eight tries against Salford, I believe seven assists in one game, or like seven seven try assists, I believe he had one game, or the pass to the assist, like involved in every single try Paul scored the two and the try that he scored at the weekend against I think was it Leeds they were playing at the weekend, like the little dummy kick catching Bra- um, Jack Walker at like shot out the line. Just caught him off guard straight through. It was beautiful, and I sat there going, "He needs to be in the England team." We're, we're, we're going to come back to this because it's World Cup year, but a player like Jack Jake Connor can't can't not be in the squad, can he? Uh, it's hard to say because Jake. Like, I think it is sort of well documented that Jake Connor, to an extent, struggles to defend. Um, what I think's happened is since he's moved to fullback. It, and he's able to get his hands on pretty much any ball he wants to get his hands on uh, in terms of whether it's on the left side of the pitch or the right side or even up the middle. We've seen that the natural talent he has, which I think for since probably since he sort of played centre against New Zealand in yeah. 2018. Yeah, in the game over in Denver, yeah. Yeah, since sort of that sort of since those fixtures, um, like we've known that Jake Connor is probably one of the most talented English players. It's just a case of we can't really fit him at, fit him in at centre, and we can't really fit him in in the halves because other players just have a bit more composure or a bit more yeah um, structure to their game or a bit more speed and things like that. But now at fullback, he seems to have found a place where he can put his magic on the on the ball. I think that the reason we wouldn't see him get exported to the NRL. Is because I don't think there's a position. I don't think that his defence is good enough from that fullback position to be able to sort of make it um, at fullback there. Um, but it is. I think he's got to uh, at least be a utility option off the bench because I think he's a game changer. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's I, a good call. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think. I think if you're taking a twenty-six man squad or twenty-five man squad, you look at the versatility of certain players that should be playing for England. Tompkins can play at fullback and in the halves. Wellsby can play at fullback in the halves at centre. I think he played a little bit of 13 in the Challenge Cup final as well. You're looking at the versatility of Jake Connor, fullback, centre, halfback. They're not necessarily fantastic or the best if they're that position in, in like in the Super League or whether whatever, but they are the best players in that league. The three best players in Super League at the minute, in terms of backs, are could all slip into a number one shirt in the World Cup, like, and you wouldn't, you probably, you probably wouldn't be upset with any of them, if that makes sense, because they're all so good at what they yeah. do. Something else I'd sort of mention is you mentioned um, Jack Wellsby there, and if you compare him and Jake Connor statistically, yeah. Wellsby's got two tries, nine assists, and Connor's got three tries, ten assists, and then Connor's played uh, one less game as well. Connor's played one less game, but then. He's made two more missed tackles. Um, I think Connor's made 13 tackle busts. Wellsby's made 18 tackle busts. They're actually 
surprisingly comparable players, mm. um, which is quite interesting because I think that I'd be of the opinion if you ask me who's the next player to go to the NRL, I'd I'd probably say Jack Wellsby. Um, but that would be my call, um, which is just quite interesting in terms of that player I'm seeing there as this player who is good enough for the NRL is actually very comparable to. Uh, to to, a play, to the player I'm saying isn't, but yeah. Yeah, I think the, the difference between obviously Wellsby and Connor is that age. Well, Wellsby's a, a good few years younger than Jake Connor, but Connor has the experience and he seems to have calmed down a little bit. He's still the chirpy Jake Connor that we know, and he'll get under everyone's skin. But he seems to have composed himself and not, and this season especially, not not that doesn't retaliate as much. And I think maybe his maturity this season. Might pick might prove him ahead of the likes of like Zach Hardacre, who at Wigan is going to be a favourite for Sean Wayne. But I'd, I'd rather take Connor over Hardacre in terms of in terms of what he offers. Yeah. Well, the other sort of interesting part of that is that Connor in his less games has actually made two more clean breaks. Um, yeah, but I, I I do agree as long as Zach Hardacre isn't sort of part of the master plan. Um, I do sort of you know I'd agree with something with something along those lines that. Um, you need to start looking at players who are going to win you games and not just sort of be a solid part of the squad. Um, and that is, you know, and I think, well, Wellsby and Connor both, but, you know, Connor especially is definitely heading that way now where he's going to be, he could be a dominant player in Super League for the next three or four years. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's, it's tough. And Sean Wayne is not, is not in an easy position in terms of what he needs to do. And he knows the players that he likes and he knows the type of system that he wants to play. So we can't knock it. We just hope that he picks the best players available. Um, but we, we need to move on. We've got plenty of other things to talk about. Um, it's Hall of Fame time. It I think it was meant to be one of your guys' turns this week. But I kind of, because we we reset everything, and I went and I, I've chosen a Hall of Fame member that, it's another post posthumous one, which is really sad to see because so many legends of, of Rugby League have, have passed away lately. Um we had Inga the winger a few weeks ago. David Stevenson this week as well. Another one that passed away this week was, was Dave Hadfield, uh, a rugby league journalist who, at the age of 70, did so much for the sport. Like, he's... I don't know what... I don't really... I never met him, but he's a name that was always there. Like, you'd always read an article from Dave about rugby league every week, whether he'd help, be helping get something in from the World Cup from the other side of the world or he'd be writing for the Independent or writing his own books, travelling the world or travelling the le- the length and like the width of the, the United Kingdom to write about rugby league land, like 3,000 miles for nothing. Like it wasn't being paid to do it. Did it off his own back to, to cover the game. And just paint pictures with words and he was loved and respected throughout the game and he's a reason that I always wanted to get into rugby league journalism along with the likes of Martin Sadler and Phil Kaplan, who n- my parents knew, or my, like, do you know what I mean? Like, these guys inspired a gen- like people to carry on doing it. Without these guys putting the effort in and the hard yards at the start of their career, people would have stopped. Like, the rugby league that we know and the, the stuff that we read and watch and everything just wouldn't be there. Like half these books behind us, that behind me, probably wouldn't exist without the help of these guys. And for me, that's the reason that Dave, Dave's in the Hall of Fame. I don't really know if you two know much about about the man at all. I think, like, I think the thing the thing with rugby journalists is they can get quite a they've got a bit of a bad name because the the ones that you hear the most of at the moment tend to be the sort of sensationalist ranty types, um, but. At the end of the day, it is, it's a really important thing that we've got these guys like Dave Hatfield that spread the message of rugby league to, to the world. You know, that's our sort of his his um, influence in, in the independent, which is a, like a nationwide um, a paper. His, his ability to, to spread the message of rugby league, to communicate what's going on, is, is completely invaluable so i think it's it's such, i'm really glad that you've put this in the hall of fame and it's it's um it's it's nice to see how infused you are and i guess we all owe it to 
to these guys when we're sat here doing a podcast. We're sort of um, following in the footsteps that, that these guys have um, trailblazed for us. So, yeah, definitely fantastic entry. Well, yeah, I couldn't put it better. I couldn't put it better than um, the two of you. So, well, well sort of, oh, welcome to the Hall of Fame, um, Dave Hadfield. But also, obviously, may you live on with us for um, many years in terms of your influence. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Rest in peace to Dave Hadfield. I'm wishing you, your family the the best that we can offer them. And for those of you out there that haven't read any of Dave's books, go and do it. They're they're available to buy anywhere if you go to your local library you'll probably find one you, you might find one depending on where, where you're from go out there grab yourself a book and and read it he's written some absolutely fantastic books from down and under over in the uk to rugby league lands Just go out there and, and read something um dave covered a lot of challenge cup finals in his time and, and it, it kind of swiftly moves on to a topic that we need to talk about um It's the, it's the Challenge Cup itself. So we had the draw for the round this week. What are your thoughts on, on sort of how the Challenge Cup's gone this year? Have you enjoyed watching it and all the coverage that it's got? Yeah, I mean, you, we were talk, you, you put in the chat the, the other day about all the games that are being televised, and it's more than I can ever remember, to be honest. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty empowering. It's pretty good for, from a rugby league point of view. We spoke about it um, a few weeks ago, how to try and get hold of streams when we were growing up. It was like dodgy YouTube channels, and we'd see the catch. I remember watching the Super League show, and it was um, just literally like the score was on the screen, and the match report was somebody just reading out what had happened. So to see now that it's so accessible, many of it is, is free. If it's not free, it's... Um, you know, it's not too expensive and it's great quality. So I've loved the fact that we've been able to get such a good coverage of the Challenge Cup at these early stages that previously hasn't been accessible to. Uh, Toby, what are your thoughts on on that? Like you, you said five of this week's or five of the next round's games of the eight that we've got in the in the next round are going to be on telly, whether it be BBC, Premier Sports or Channel 4. We've got five out of eight games. That, you can't ask for more than that, can we? Maybe we could ask Sky to pick one up. Yeah, I, well, yeah, it's um, it's not Channel Four; it's um, the Sportsman. Sportsman, um, sorry, I thought Channel Four. Yeah, so uh, that's because the whole KR fixture got announced literally like on, on the same. There we go. Yeah, the same window. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's funny because I'm left wanting to ask for more. <laughs> um, because of the games that have been picked up, yeah. Um, but there's very good reasons why it's the games that have been picked up that have been picked up. Um, it is it's good to see. I really like the fact that um, the RFL are running with Premier Sports, and I've got a feeling that they're testing Premier Sports as a as a new contract sort of yeah, definitely area um, for a few years from now. Um, yeah, it's. Um, it is really nice to see. I think it's um, it's challenging because it all's clashing with football at the moment, um, and it leaves me with some very tough decisions often. Um, but it's um, yeah, it's very positive to see that we've really sort of we've said like we've seen what rugby league's doing on it during its time slots on Channel Four, um, and we're saying look, let's really push to. Um, get this game shown um for as many people as possible especially now that there's awareness of what you know what exactly the game you know what exactly the game is and um what exactly it entails from the start of the season that's now being carried on it's going to it's a constant feature of tv right at least through till may now um when the challenge cup final is so it's really it's really positive to see it's it's giving tv audiences now have more to watch for free throughout the season and rugby league gets to stay with them not just it doesn't just appear in their tv guide and they go oh if i remember i will watch that because i watched it last year yeah. no, it's like no nope, i get to watch it february february then i've got a week off then march march and yeah be really positive um i don't know why um i think it, it but the games being streamed on our league um bbc when they when they were streamed on bbc sport and the sportsman um 
for some reason, I sort of, I personally sometimes struggle to sort of tune in just in terms of, um, I'll go, I'll be, it, because it's not directly on the TV channel, I don't like necessarily mark it as a date because I'm always like, oh, I can just pick it up on my phone while I, and then I forget to pick it up on my phone and things. So I don't know whether, um, I don't know what sort of statistics are saying about sort of like streaming, but um, there's something where I know that I feel quite guilty when I haven't watched a game on the Sportsman or I haven't watched um, a game on our league, but then I also forget to sort of put them into my schedule. Um, I don't know whether there's sort of a good enough, um, good enough sort of social media build, whereas like so um, BBC and um, Premier Sports will really push these fixtures on their own channels as well. Yeah. I'm not sure we're necessarily getting um, enough people saying, make sure you tune into the sports and make sure you, uh, you know, I don't know if there's enough voices sort of doing that, but they've got Whitehaven St. Helens, which for me is one of the games I really want to watch. Um, so I definitely will be tuning in for this, for that one. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I love the fact that the men have been able to watch so much rugby league this year. I think I mentioned, I think if you had, well, you said all the NRL games are live to watch in full on YouTube. Well, not live to watch, but the whole games have been uploaded in full onto YouTube. If you're a Watch NRL subscriber, you can watch all of those. So what's that? Eight games a weekend of NRL you could watch. You've got, I think we had five super, four Super League games at the weekend. We had, and then we had a championship game at the weekend. So you're looking at 14 games of rugby in the UK that you can watch, whether that be on your computer, on your phone, or on your telly, which is fantastic. If you include the Challenge Cup rounds from earlier in the year where you had a Super League tie, the Championship, and then the League 1 and Challenge Cup ties all weekend. If the NRL was on that weekend as well, like, unbelievable. I think it was the NR NRL trial weekend when the all the NRL trials were on Sky, and it was Challenge Cup round three. You had the Championship fixtures, and you had Super League fixtures all on the same weekend. That is ridiculous. The amount of Rugby League that was just on telly, it's not all of it's free, like you said. But I don't think I've watched as much rugby league this year than I have in the last three seasons put together, and I don't know if you two feel the same way about that. Yeah, I, I, do you know what? Like, so obviously the World Cup's been postponed, and I, I feel like there was a real big push to to get all of those fixtures were televised, and it was meant to happen at the end of twenty twenty one, and it was this like build towards the end of 2021 and we didn't know if it was happening or not so it sort of carried momentum mm. and then because it's been pushed back another year we've sort of like increased the coverage and just like carried it on for an, and so we're building even greater so in a way i think it was a blessing in disguise because we like established these contacts that were going to show us on their channel we sort of sold rugby league to them and then and then gave them like another in, in a way another like big Thing to build towards so i think that's played a massive part in what we're seeing now which is such a massive increase in coverage and it's and it's mint i really i'm really pleased because i just hope it brings new eyeballs in and we're talking about like there's 14 games a weekend you can watch or whatever you there's probably you're probably not going to watch them all but if there's more teams playing there's more likelihood that people are going to go my team's playing or this team that my friend follows or my local town are on TV, I'll watch it and hopefully we can just like keep attracting new people in and in with and with this build towards the great competition at the end of the year and then hopefully off the back of that it just continues. That's my big hope. I've got six weeks off in the summer. I'll be watching rugby league five days out of seven. Like you think Thursday, Friday, you've got the NRL on the Saturday morning if there's not any games on in the afternoon. Your Sunday games, you might, I might be at a live one, and then you've got your Monday night game on Premier Sports. Like to be able to watch live rugby league five days, out, I don't think you can watch football five days out of seven without. If you just include league football, I mean, like on TV, you forget Europe. You think league football, whether that's Premier League, Championship, like any other across the world, five out of seven days a week. Because I know for a fact that not every Monday there's a game on. We know there's going to be a game every Monday night this season. So you have to literally take time off work, work just to watch it. That's how much there is. Yeah, and I think, and that's the thing. I don't want to get sort of carried away because we've spoken a lot about the fantastic TV coverage and like coverage that the sports getting this year. I want to focus more on the cup itself and and how it's run. Are we are we happy with the fact that we've got twelve super or uh, eleven super league teams and only five? 
non-Super League teams in the round of 16? Do you think the Super League teams have come in too late? Do you think, like, what what are your, your before I sort of go into what I, my fix, that I think, the, that I've sort of lured Robin into liking, is there anything you like about the current structure of the Challenge Cup? Is there anything you don't like? I'll start off with what I like, or what I liked before we had Alex Sharp. But my, my general philosophy is that we want to see close games that are competitive. And I think that we're, we're in a point now, the 16 teams left, and most of them are in the top division. So we're going to see the highest quality of games at the most important time in the Cup. And so for me, whilst I am sad that we've lost those lower leagues and, and amateur sides, I'm... This is now where we'll get the most um, eyeballs and like hopefully the most um, neutrals and new people to the game. So we want them to see the best version of our product and that's what we've got with this current structure. So I like it from the point of view of we've got the best teams playing in hopefully the closest games at the most important time of the competition. That's my standpoint. What, what don't you like? I don't like the fact that, I mean, okay, so we were talking about earlier, so if you if you wanted to make the competition totally fair, so every team had, to, had the same chance of getting to the final, then every single team would be entered in round one. But obviously, that would just be complete carnage and almost a bit of a waste of time. So we've had to sort of meddle with it a little bit, and we've got like the seeded teams that come in later in the competition to, to sort of manufacture this more close close sort of entertaining matches between evenly matched teams but it's kind of like where do you draw the line where at what point do you stop meddling and how and what and when do you, do you are we making it too easy because it, it, it's easier it's easier for a team at the top of the, of the game to win than it is for a team at the bottom which just it feels wrong but yeah you know, you've got you've got to do it so where do you draw the line and I, in a way this is too easy i don't really know if um it's how else do you do it? I know you've got you've got an idea, but the truth is you're gonna get more blowout scores. You're gonna get um, mismatches. So I think this is a, a good way to con condense it. But yeah, it what deep down inside, it, I know it's unfair. I know that it's manufactured, and sports sh should be a level playing field, and this isn't a level level playing field. No, I agree. I, I, I like. Well, we, we all love a close game of rugby league. We don't like to see blowouts. But you look at, you had York play Newcastle in round four. They that was forty two thirteen. Whitehaven Doncaster only a league between them. That was sixty nil. Bat and then but then the Batley Royal Navy game was only sixty six six. So there's a bigger gap between Batley and the Royal Navy than, than there is between Doncaster and Whitehaven. But the score was like the, the margin of score was the same. So I don't know, like you say, you're gonna, you are going to get more blowouts if a Super League side faces a League One side, or or potentially lower. But you're also, you've also got that chance of more, more lower level teams, community level and League One sides, making it further in the competition if they if they draw each other. Um, Toby, do you think that the Super League type sides should be able to play or should have to play one more game in order to get to the Challenge Cup final? Because at the minute, they only have to play three, and then they're at Wembley if they win them all. Yeah, at a minimum, I'd, I'd like the Super League sides to have to at least win. What, what, I think it would be five total, wouldn't it, if they came in? And it... Yeah, if they won the Cup, they, you'd want them to win five games. Yeah, I, I, think, I think five, but also that's five games where you're, you're, you're hoping that they've had to sort of actually overcome a challenge. Um you know, you think about the way that the cup draw like works. If if you could be lucky enough to not actually play another Super League team or not until a semi final. Um, but also like I don't know, I think you need to increase the chance of sort of those early knockouts and increase the chance of a championship yeah. getting further or, or a League One club getting further. Um I think in terms of um if you ask me the sort of what I like and what I don't like questions that um, asked Robin, the thing that um, yeah, the thing that I really sort of don't like about this um, is the fact that there is the fact that we complain regularly, and I think it's 
I don't think anyone doesn't complain about either loop fixtures or having to play the same team three or four times a season before you even reach the playoffs. Yeah. And I would genuinely rather, if I was a, as a fan of a club, I would rather play someone who I've never seen play before. Um, and it, despite the fact it's going to be a, a blowout, obviously there's chance that there's the risk factor that comes along with that of injuries and things, which you have to be mindful of, I guess. But I'd rather see that than have to have a team come to our home ground for what would be the third time in a season or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. So that for me is sort of the main reason. But I, but then I think it's a very good point that Robin made in terms of do you really want, you know, you've got to keep these scores close. Um, I think that for me it's just basically letting the Super League clubs just buy their way into a... Um, a big money fixture. Into a, well, into a winning lottery effectively, yeah. Um, yeah. It's that, like, no, if you could enter at the round of 16, none of you really have a bad Challenge Cup performance. No. You can either get a tough draw and lose, but it was against a team you're going to lose to twice more this season anyway. Or you have um, or you beat someone who wasn't really at your level, um, and then you lose or whatever. It's just that kind of, like, I just don't think that it... I think that it's basically... There's going out the Challenge Cup isn't actually... Not even going out the Challenge Cup, but... When you being in the last sixteen of the Challenge Cup is already effectively doing well in it, yeah, mm. and you automatically be put being put into it. Yeah, I, I was looking at sort of historically how many games a Super League team would have to play, and a Super League team in order to win the Challenge Cup has never had to play more than five matches, and that that's fine. That that's that's that that's that's perfect, and I think. You, if you ask them to win four, you're, they're only ever going to play another Super League side, arguably. Obviously, you're going to have a few bad players. Like said, we've got five championship sides in there in order to make it. But if Toulouse had chosen to play in it, and you've got 12, you're only going to get four championship sides to enter because you're only going to have you're going to have a quarter final, and then you're going to have you're going to have a round of eight, a round of 16, and another round of eight. In the way that they, in, on the current system, the way I sort of I'll, I'll sort of get into my fix now. Five games for a Super League side to win a Challenge Cup. Perfect. They enter a round of 32. The round before that is a round of 40, of which you've got 14 Championship Clubs, which means Toulouse and Cornwall, who aren't in it this year, would have to take part. You have to make them take part. If they don't take part, the logistics of it become awkward and it become difficult. You, if, if, if Toulouse don't take part in a round of 32, you have to add eight more teams into the first round in order to lower it enough so that there's a one spot in there. It makes it so so much more difficult to enter. Of those of the round of 40, which would be the third round, 14 of those clubs for the championship, and you've got um, 36 winners from the second round. Of those 36, of those sort of, sort of, of the round of 52, 36 winners. Of those 52 teams, you've got 11 League One sides enter in the second round of the Cup. I think as they do now, they're in, they enter in the second round of the Cup, I believe, now. Before that, you've got 41 winners from the first round, which means you've got 82 community-level sides or rep sides or amateur sides, whatever you want to call them, but they aren't, they're no lower. They're semi-pro team. They're not semi-pro teams, so they're amateur sides. They, these players don't get paid to play. They can come from it wherever. How I've sorted it out is that you've got all your National Conference League sides, Premier Division, League uh, Division 1, Division 2, Division 3. Those four leagues automatically in the Challenge Cup, every single one of those teams. I know some teams have got like Siddle under 23s and whatever, and some of them have got B teams and stuff in other leagues. And that's fine. We can work around that. You've got all your Southern Conference League teams. The teams in the South, the, rather than just handpick one or two, let all those Southern Conference League Tier 4, which is what it's called, teams enter. Because according to the RFL, it's the same level as the National Conference Premier Division. So why not have all those teams in it? You think below National Conference League, you've got all your regional leagues. So your Midlands, Welsh, Scottish, Irish, East, West of England, South West, London, North West Men's, North East and Yorkshire Men's League. All the winners of those leagues, or the low, or the highest ranked equivalent, if a second team wins it, or a, a sort of the, the second team wins the competition, the highest ranked available team 
from that league gets entered into the competition. You also allow your university national cup winner and your university national cup runner-up teams enter the competition. You've got your British Army, your Royal Navy, your GB Police and your Royal Air Force. That leaves you 79, that leaves, that's 79 teams. You then have three teams from Europe. You invite three European teams to enter the Challenge Cup. We liked it when they invited Red Star Belgrade. When Toronto first entered the competition, they weren't a League One side. These teams that are entering are then they don't then they shouldn't have to travel the length and breadth of the UK to go and play. Make it regionalised. Do a computer generated draw where the teams are regionalised. The country split into four. You've got North East, North West, South East, and South West. So that like so a team in London does not have to travel any further than Derby. And your teams in West Yorkshire and Lancashire and your teams in like East Yorkshire and maybe like probably Scotland would probably fit into that. So your teams from the Midlands and the South West will probably be in the same league. You don't want these lower level teams having to tra travel because that's what puts them off. They do it in the FA Cup in the early rounds. It's not difficult. The, the RFL could easily regionalise the first round to make it easier before the League One players come in. And before we came on to air, me and Robin were talking... If a community level side drew a community level side every round and you were guaranteed that they were split 50-50, so you'd always have one, you'd have 41 in round two, you'd have a guaranteed 20 or like 20 in the second, the third round, 10 in round four, five in the round of 32, no, yeah, five in the round of 32, two in the round of 16, and potentially one in the quarterfinals. Like, that's scary when you think about it. But if a community level side always drew a community level side, you'd have you could have one community like that that's men that's mental when you think about that. And that's I kind of won Robin over with that and I don't know why, because he that goes completely opposite against his I don't know if you want to explain how that won you over, it, Robin. The reason it won me over is because for that to happen, the the odds are so small and we're also we, we kind of decided that it was like fifty fifty the win, but it really wouldn't be and if they drew a no. uh, uh, another uh, a team from another division, then it's definitely not 50-50. So when you think of the likelihood of that happening, it's so small that actually it's almost irrelevant when the Super League clubs... This, this is what I'm saying. It's almost irrelevant when the Super League clubs come in because the truth is we know that they're going to be in the quarterfinal, semi-final, final. Yeah, 100%. So I like I liked the way that you did it. I, it, I mean, obviously... It, Increasing the teams increases like the logistical challenges, but I like the fact that um, it it adds it adds an extra game for the Super League sides, and it still gives a chance for teams to get an upset, for teams to go a little bit further than statistically fifty fifty they really should do. Yeah, it and you know, like we, it's it's a it's a really difficult thing to balance. We like to see close games. But we also like to see matchups that we don't see regularly. Like Toby was saying, you want to see a championship club play a, a Super League club. All these things you like to see. So it's it's so difficult to do. But I I think that yours is the best the best attempt of balancing all of those things. So long uh, the only the only real challenge is just the fact that there's just a number of teams. That's the yeah. only real. Th but if if you can get over that, then this is the best attempt I've seen at solving all those problems. Toby, do you see? Do you think there could be a, a fix to sort of, not maybe a fix, but a little adjustment to what I've just sort of announced and what you two have had a obviously a little bit more of an in depth look at? Um, I think that the actual league structure in general isn't in the best place it's ever going to be. I think eleven League One teams isn't the amount of League One teams we're going to have forever. No. Yeah, you know, I think that I don't think necessarily the Super League's at its best with twelve teams, etc. So I think that would be the only thing is how that. How it would have to adapt to something like that, but in terms of, you know, I think the way any cup competition should, like that should work is you decide what what stage you want your highest level teams to come in, yeah, and you just work back from there. And I think that I think for me it's huge that the conference leagues get represented uh, in full because you know they are all to be in the national conference league no matter what tier or to be in mm. the southern conference league means you are at the top of the amateur game. Yeah. Um and I yeah, and so that's why for me it's it's very important they're all involved. And then 
I, I, this is how I always sort of remember the Challenge Cup anyway, as having all the NCL in it. And then it was it, before the Southern Conference League, it'd be like a Southern Conference winner, this winner, that winner. That's that's how I remember. I said I might have just been remembering it wrong, but to me, that's always what the Challenge Cup has been anyway. And now it's just we've got the Southern Conference League now to be able to sort of pad it out. I have this is absolutely to me sort of the system I want. So, Wait. Yeah. do you think this something this is it popped into my head now, and it's a question that neither of you have heard? Spanish football, Copa del Rey, right? Toby, you probably know more than Robin. The lowest ranked team in that draw. So, say if Real Madrid get drawn away to Barcelona, whoever fin whoever is currently higher in the league or whoever is finished higher the year before, is the away team. So if a championship side draws a Super League side, the draw is flipped, so the championship side is always at home. So if a community level side drew, say, I don't know, let's use Hammersmith Hills Hoists and Lee, Lee, Lee Centurions, for an example. Do you think Lee Centurions travelling down to Hammersmith would be would be viable? Do you think that would be something that you could see happening, or is it just a little bit? Is that too far fetched? So you're saying the the home fixture is awarded to the team who's ranked the lowest? lowest. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So my so I I like I like it because you're going to fill out a small stadium, and so it's going to be a fantastic atmosphere. It's a great opportunity for that that team to earn an extra revenue and it sort of rewards you staying in the cup so it give, as if there isn't enough of an incentive it gives an extra one but the only thing is are you, are you going to get more players at the smaller ground like yes it's going to be a bumper crowd for them mm. but are there going to be more people at that game than there would be if it was at Lee and so then are you is the net result actually less fans going to watch each game and therefore less revenue all around so so my my like i i would like to propose that instead of doing it like this way you maybe um favor the larger grounds but say a proportion of the earnings for these challenge cup games should go back to the young to the to the smaller club as well yes, yeah. i don't know exactly how you would do the maths because it's kind of not really fair if you do it between Super League clubs, but if you had like a championship club hosting a community side, that could be quite a big kickback for the community side. Yeah, it could. So maybe you could like do a percentage based on the difference between the levels or something like that. Just yeah, no, I like just that. Would worry that you'd be losing revenue by always going for the smaller facility. Yeah, no, I get that. It was just a, it was just a shout to see what, see what sort of, see how you two thought about it. Yeah. What's, what's your well, thoughts on that, Toby? I mean, I'll say one of my friends um, is, um, well, who I talk to about football with, he says about the FA Cup but, um, that he wants it to be that whoever's the lowest ranked team decides where the fixtures played. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't like it in some ways because I think that it sort of gives a team an advantage and I, I don't know, I, I feel like it's, Although it's a random draw, I feel like once that draw is made, it should be played in the fairest way possible. Yeah. But you think about it where, I know from a football fan perspective, that when it comes around to cup time of year, you all you want as a non-Premier League fan is Premier League away. Yeah. That's all you want as a draw. I don't know how that translates to um, Super League where travelling fans isn't, or to Rugby League where travelling fans isn't as big a culture. Um, you know, I don't know whether... You'd someone like say Oldham, would they bring a thousand away to Leeds, or would it be would it actually be a better better for Oldham to say we're at home, a thousand one and a half thousand of you come to the home fixture, you get to see Leeds players you would you only ever yeah. see on TV, you'll only ever see on TV otherwise, uh, um and Leeds are going to bring a great atmosphere because they're going to bring two thousand down the motorway, so I don't know what's better in terms of all the fans of rugby league what they'd like more. Which is why I'd sort of, I'd be for that sort of lowest ranked team decides where to play it on the grounds of, I'd like to understand, I don't think there's enough sort of for me out, evidence for me out there to be able to say whether it would be better for the fans. And that's all I really care about, I think, at that point. Because I think that Rugby League is genuinely the most working class game oh, yeah. out there. 
Um, and I just I don't know whether for the fans it would be more beneficial to go to a new new place away or to be able to just see big, big stars at home. And I think it's, I think I'd like to sort of let teams survey their fan base and say and no, like maybe make it more personalised for them. And you know whatever's going to get the most fans of smaller clubs to come to a game and then retain their interest in that smaller club's team. Yeah, no, I hundred percent. It's it's cut it's touchy because we know that the Challenge Cup this year is not the hardest for the Super League sides, and we want to make it harder for the Super League sides. But we also want to make the game more. We want to give more exposure to the game, and we want the game to stand out, and we want it to be fantastic. The the coverage of the lower the lower league games or the, the community level games in the first and second and third round, including obviously your League One side, was, was so good, and the commentators seemed to know exactly what they were talking about about the players, obviously some commentators better than others um, at that level, because some of the, obviously the players, nobody knows the players but the, the coverage of the Army-Navy game was unreal it was absolutely fantastic the coverage of Oxford Uni versus Cambridge Uni two weekends ago was un- was unbelievable it's absolutely, like, Pete Nuttall was their sideline MC he's done that, he's done the Challenge Cup final at Wembley, like to get someone like Pete Nuttall at that game is unbelievable. Like really good. It it's 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 really interesting to see, and it's certainly something that the RFL need to look at in order to make the Challenge Cup that little bit more appealing. And like, well done to the team that wins the Challenge Cup because if it is going to be, we well, you know it's going to be a Super League team. Well done, congratulations, you've got that far, and you've and you've earned it because you've beaten four other Super League teams to get to do it. For those of them that will play Super League teams in every round. But it's not hard. It, it's it's it, we just want to see them play a few more games and like earn, earn maybe earn it a little bit more to get to the final. But we're coming up to an hour in. We need to move on. We, we need to sort of do anything. We're not going to do an NRL watch this week because we sort we spoke about sort of the NRL English exports and stuff at the start, and we so we agree not to do that. But we need to move on to a badge rating. We've not done one for a while because we were running out of time before and we skipped and we have had a couple of weeks off. Toby, you finally get your chance to speak about these two badges. It's been a, it's been a while. You've had a month to think about it. Whole KR badges, the duplicates, old and new. Where where are you filling these in? I don't have the current leaderboard on me, so I'm just going to go old and new and see which one comes out on top. Yeah, so yeah, this is interesting, actually, because it's a theme in sports. Um, sort of in sort of in Britain, um, elsewhere as well. But um, market research is showing new fans to a game do not associate with traditional crests. Um, you know your coat of arms or your um, your things like this. Fans don't particularly associate with it, and that there needs to be sort of imagery that a fan wants to put on their on their room. Um, on a chest type thing to be able to to sell shirts but also to sell interest um and it's sort of you know it's americanizing it it's to an extent australianizing it i guess um they're both sort of sports which are really focused on this sort of franchise idea um and yeah so it's it's definitely this sort of simplistic um simplistic but also sort of logo that shows more than sort of well, shows some form of um, mascot, effectively. Um, this is I, I, um, what I really like about the new Hulk AR badge is it's kept the three in a row, like the crowns are, and but it's just changed them to robins. Um, this is it's also kept the same shape of the badge, and in terms of that transition forward, I think it's done a really good job of staying in touch with its history but also um, sort of progressing forward. Now, to rate each of them individually, the old badge um, is actually something where it's very similar to a Hull FC to Hull FC's badge. Mm. Obviously, you yeah, know, which, which you'd expect with traditional badges from the exactly. same, town, so same expect, city. You'd expect that, absolutely. But in terms of, you know, um, it's three crowns, it's um, a symbol of of heart, but it also is less distinguishable from their neighbours. 
um, who don't. Oh, I think they've got the early bird. Don't, is it the early bird? The, yeah, the, the early policy? bird. Uh, yeah, they've got that. They're, they're the early bird, but they still have. I believe they still have the three crowns in the Hull FC yeah, they have, thing as well. They have yeah, the three yeah, they do. They don't have a, a strong sort of like mascot. No, no, they don't. No, they are more representative of the whole whole. Hence why they play in the twenty five thousand or thirty thousand seater stadium mm. in Hull and not a little Craven Park. And so I think <laughs> it makes sense. But yeah, so for that, I think it it represents Hull. Um, but I think that it does put you in the shadow of Hull FC a little bit. So that old badge, I think it's, a, I think it is a, it's, it's historical. It represents the city. I'd say it's around a seven and a half. You know, good. good, solid, no nice. complaint. And then the new badge, it retains all of that. It, it keeps that history. But it says, no, we're the Robins. We're not anything like those Hull FC people. Um, people. But we are still from Hull. Yeah. Um, and it keeps that. And although I think the red's a little bit bright, <laughs> it's a little bit. Yeah, it's a bit. They've kind of like they've brightened the red a little bit, haven't they? They've kind of they've kind of kept the crowns though. I like that. I like the fact they've kind of kept the crowns with the robins. So I, I, they've they've worked really well on trying to. They've done that for me. I like that. I'm a big fan of that. I, I don't know where I stand in terms of just putting the, the name on the badge as whole KR. I feel like the whole Kingston Road, the, the whole Drop. the whole not the whole, yeah. the Kingston Rovers could be written underneath, and it wouldn't be that. It, it wouldn't be that sort of bad but it's uh, and then when you see sort of they just take one of the small robins and put them on like training kits and stuff i think that's really cool mm. so i think they've really have rebranded themselves well um and that's why i'd sort of but i wouldn't say it's sort of different enough to give it too high a mark but i think that it would be an eight i think nice it's just re- maintain the history of the club but also it's moved forward into what is needed in the future for probably and I, I mean i could be wrong here but one of the one of the more growing clubs in Super League, I'd say, in whole KR. Yeah, definitely. They're probably you looking at last season, especially. They were the best team in that city, by by far, and they they seem to be doing a wonderful job. They you have to call them whole KR or the Robins now. There is no whole KR. They had they dropped the Kingston Rovers completely, just a KR. Um, from what I remember from the end of last season when they when they sort of brought it out and. It was interesting because I've never called them Hulkingston Rovers. You never said it in full. No one, I don't think that everyone, anyone ever said Hulkingston Rovers when describing the team. They were always Hull KR or KR or the Robins. They were never, you never said it all in one go. It's like, you know, you don't say Salford Red Devils. You say Salford or the Red Devils. You don't say Salford City Reds or it was either Salford or the City Reds. It's like, they've done that. They've dropped the Kingston Rovers. They've made it modern. They've tried to bring in. That, that sort of modernised franchise, which is quite, like you said, Americanised, Australianised, like NRL light, which is quite nice. Speak so an improvement overall. Yeah, an improvement of 0.5 overall. Um, speaking of NRL li, NRL eyes, we need to move on to set of six. It's time for our our big set of six, and we obviously we missed the opening weekend of the NRL. We were very impressed with some of the fixtures and. I was quite impressed with the way Wests played, despite the fact we lost against Melbourne. I was very impressed with Canberra's win. Shocked to see Brisbane beating South Sydney. Um, Newcastle Knights overcame the Roosters in in a nice win for them as well. It, it, it Few shocks, few surprises, but players that stand out were always going to stand out at the weekend. But the fixture, the first fixture for us this weekend is Melbourne Storm versus South Sydney. Uh, Melbourne Storm with two season-ending injuries from the last game. Christian Welch and George Jennings both out for the rest of the season and Brandon Smith out for at least five weeks with a broken hand. Do you think South Sydney can come up and, and beat them can, and go to Melbourne and beat them this weekend? Uh, Robin, I'll go with you first. Well, I think this is a big one for the Troll Mitchell. Obviously, it's his first week back. Um, he'll, he'll have a point to prove, but it's a, I mean, it's a long time, isn't it, to be, to be off off like not playing to not have so he's not got bringing any form into it um and obviously like the storm knocked down a little bit from their losses but uh, at home um i'm still gonna back the storm yeah nice i think i think i'm gonna have to agree and the only reason i'm agreeing is because i love harry grant and harry grant could be a player that melbourne look to when brandon smith leaves at the end of the season because Brandon Smith, we know, is not going to be at Melbourne forever. And he's 
I don't know if he's signed, officially signed for the Dolphins for 2023, but there's a huge shout he'll be out. He'll be on his way to the the, the second Brisbane team and, and the Redcliffe area for, for 2023. And they, they need they need to keep Harry Grant in and around the club. And this is his chance to show them that they can afford to let Brandon Smith go. Yeah, Welch and um, Brandon Smith are going to be a, a huge misses. Um, I think that the Melbourne Pack is, they I think they really are sort of undergoing that revitalisation ahead of next year when they lose Kafusi. Um, I believe, do they lose Bromwich? Um, yeah, I believe one of the Bromwich. Both, I think both Bromwich brothers are heading yeah. to, to, to the Dolphins they, they next year. Lose, they basically lose all of the, the team that's become such yeah. a dynasty. Um, so they're in a sort of rebuilding phase whilst still having good players and um, I think that this season isn't going to be one where they where they win because of that. The other thing I sort of mentioned is when you look through last weekend, the only like although South lost to Brisbane and struggled a little bit to create some attacking spark, the only place where they really made a defensive error was um, was when um, Kurt Capewell, who turned into Prime Johnson <laughs> Thurston during that game, has like tried as I think he's thrown. Um, well, yeah, I think Tarn Milne shot out the line to try and tackle him. Yeah. And he just left the whole wing open for um, for the Corey Oates to score um, down the left-hand side, which was great to see him score again. Whereas you look at Melbourne against West, and that first half, Melbourne were all over the place. And I don't think it got much better in the second half, but I think West sort of crumbled. Um, but yeah, in terms of um, Remus Smith looked really uncomfortable under the high ball and um, Nick Meany, who's now going to be replaced by Cam Munster, so it, that's probably not that vivid. Nick Meany, I think, struggled to organise that left edge defence a little yes. bit. Um, so it was, but I'm, obviously Cam Munster's going to start seeing changes that. But I think that actually, based on that, Melbourne made more mistakes, so I would take South Sydney in this game. Nice. That was a really long way of you telling us that, that I knew as soon as you said about the losses that you were going south, and I was waiting for you to say it. But I'm, but I'm so glad. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 this is, you need to get your NRL watch in there. We're going to switch to Super League. Um, I have to say, this episode will be out after that game, so you will already know the result of that game, so you will know whether Toby's come out on top or whether me and Robin have stretched our lead ahead of Toby, who's now lingering at the bottom of the table. But he's only two points behind me, so it's not too bad. Um, we're going to game two. Salford Red Devils at home against Leeds Rhinos. Leeds have struggled this year. Richard, if Richard Agar loses this game, if Leeds lose, there is a chance he's out the door. Um, and for that reason, because I like to see Leeds suffer and I want Richard Agar to stay at Leeds, I'm going to go for a Leeds win. I'm really torn. <laughs> this game. Um, I think I. Well, we expected big things for Leeds and they've been inconsistent. I didn't expect a lot from Salford and they started well. So um, I think my head is saying that it should be Leeds, but I'm scared to, to put Leeds just because I, I just feel like the inconsistency that we saw last year has carried over. Uh, and I'm seeing this as an opportunity to go for something different and take a lead on the table. So I'm going to back the Salford Red Devils. We've split the field there, Toby. You're, you're last up again. You're going first for game three, so just so you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Leeds, Leeds, were, Leeds are basically as back to full strength as you can ask to be during a season. Um, I saw a really funny tweet from a Leeds uh, a Rhinos fan a few days ago saying, why can't Jack Broadbent get into this team? What's he done with Agar's daughter? Which, which really <laughs> made me think <laughs> <laughs> <And, laughs> <but, laughs> Really brilliant, brilliant! I like that. I like that. I want to find that tweet. Yeah, but um, I think I spoke about how last season Leeds won two from their first seven, and they've got to win. Effectively, they've got to win one um, at some point. Then um, in this game or next game, so I'll say I'll back them to beat Salford this week. We're going Leeds as well. Uh, straight into game three for you, Toby. You're back to your your NRL. The Sydney Roosters host the Manly Sea Eagles this week. Yeah, this is a this is a really difficult um, game to call. I think both teams had uncharacteristic performances um, in their first game. Um, Roosters got took apart by a very sort of 
um, flawless night in all in all seriousness. Even the try that Sydney scored at the end, I don't really count that as something that Newcastle should kick themselves about conceding. Um, I find it interesting, obviously, that I think Jared Warrior Hargreaves had the worst game I've seen him play in a long time. Um, he's a liability. He's a liability, that man. Yeah, Paul Momorowski it hasn't replaced Matty Cavalli, which is quite an interesting phrase. I didn't think I'd be saying shock horror. Um, but then surprisingly, you know, you go to a team that's just as good in terms of um, Manly. I think that they really struggled. I think their second row sort of struggled defensively. Um, I think that Kieran Foran struggled defensively. Um, but ironically, if Tom Trebojevic doesn't get handled by um, the Sydney uh, by the Sydney the way Penrith handled him, then all of a sudden none of that really matters because he's going to put them on the front foot constantly. Yeah. Um, however, I did see you know I'm going to start off with my sort of philosophy about that like who's making more mistakes and where the mistakes are coming from. And for me, that would mean that I think Manly did make a couple more mistakes against Penrith compared to Sydney against Newcastle, and I I, I take Sydney in this. Gonna go for for the Roosters on this one. You're going double Sydney, which is interesting to see, which is nice. Uh, Robin, you, where are you heading for this one? Um, I'm I'm gonna agree with Toby. I'm gonna go for the Roosters for this one. I think it was. Um, I don't think last week was a good reflection of where they're actually at. I think it was an upset. And they'll have a point to prove this week. So, yeah, Roosters for me. Yeah, I mean, you look at the players that they don't have playing for them. They don't have um, Daniel Fafita. They don't have Kevin Nagama. They don't have Adam Kieran. Lachlan Lamb's not available. In terms of, like, they've brought these players in and no, they've not, no, no lads have sort of gone out. Gone out. They've not lost anyone. They're going to be on form. And then you're going to have to go for the Roosters again as well. I don't know if the Manly C... We know the Manly Seagulls are inconsistent. They're one of the most inconsistent teams in the NRL. It's just whether they're going to stay inconsistent this year or they're going to be better as the year goes on. And I think, I think the Roosters are too good to lose to a Manly team that isn't much stronger than the team it was last year. Uh, game four, we're going to drop all the way down, back to England, back to the National Conference League Premier Division. Uh, Lee Miners Rangers versus Hunslet Club Parkside. Uh, who wants to go? Who wants to take this one? Can I ask? Do either of you know what's what's the table looking like at the moment? Which team? Huns, Huns Club Parkside are sixth. They've won one, lost one. They've scored twenty eight and they've conceded eighteen. And Lee Minor Rangers are have uh, eighth. They've won one, lost one, scored twenty eight oh. and conceded forty. Wow! <laughs> so it's going to be. Uh... It's a humdinger in the mid in oh. the middle mid table. One win, one loss. Which which one of these teams is is gonna? Have... You know what? I'm gonna go first. Um, Hunslet Club Parkside are gonna win this game because they had the best run of the Challenge Cup out of a lot of the NCL teams, and I just I think they're a team that, with the players they've got available, some of the players they've got in their team could arguably play in League One football, like League One rugby league. So I'm gonna go for Hunslet Club Parkside. I'll be honest. Before before we started, that's the that's the team that I circled only because of the Challenge Cup run. Um, I just and now I've found out that they're slightly above me in the table. It's only confirmed my choice. I'm going for Hunslet. Are we going triple whammy for Hunslet, or are you going to go for, I, for Lee Miners? I'm just going to do heads for Hunslet and uh, tails for. <laughs> So that is head for Hunslet. <laughs> I love the fact that this is your bottom of the league and you're flipping coins to see who you think is going to win. Um, another game that I think is going to be quite interesting this weekend, back we go all the way up to the top of, or sort of mid mid Super League, is Hull FC versus Hull, uh, Huddersfield Giants. They're two teams that are on form, two teams that have impressed so far this season. They've scored the second and third most amount of tries in the league so far this year behind Saints. Huddersfield have made the most metres, but Hull FC have got Jake Connor. <laughs> so, who wins this game? Is it going to be the Jake to Snake show, or is McGilvery going to go out there and score a hat trick and show that he could still play for England at the end of the year? I mean, I just want to mention that sort of just at the time of recording this, Super League have just tweeted out um, an assists leaderboard after five rounds, and Tui Lola here and Jake Connor are actually tied at the top for 10. So, it, it's literally a battle of the most creative fullbacks. In the league, which 
Oh. Which is yeah. mental because Tui Dollar here is wearing six and Will Price is wearing one. And that's doing my head in, by the way. I know. And the one thing is, Price, they didn't want to start Price first game of the season. And then all the healers come out at fullback and gone, no, remember me from 2016 in the NRL. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I don't know where you've all been. I've been, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for my shot, and Will Price is filled in at halfback, and he, he's played really well. And he's not, he's not, he's not international level yet. He's not that level. But if he continues to develop the way he's developing, he's there's competition for that for for him and Jack Wellsby and and the young fullbacks that are coming through the system. Yeah, they're looking really strong, uh, Huddersfield, and uh, and as our whole, um, I think. You know, I'm not going to flip a coin for this one. <laughs> I, am, I think I'm going to take Huddersfield because you know, um, their back line actually is more experienced, despite Will Price being in there, than what Hull FC are offering at the moment in terms of their current sort of state of play. Where they've, I mean, they've got Jamie Shaw playing wing. They've got um, McNamara and Loverdeer as a makeshift halves pair almost. Um, I actually think that um, I actually think that Huddersfield are in a better position to win this game, assuming that these two teams are at the sort of similar standard. This and this this is a game that sort of will 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 decide which of these teams is going to finish higher on the table. I think this is where we sort of separated the top from the bottom. We said Hull FC are good enough to move up, but we had Huddersfield finishing a lot lower. And yeah, our predictions were bang wrong at the minute the way the league's going, apart from obviously Saints and Catalan and Wigan. But we we need to prove we need to show that one of these teams is better than the other, and that's why I'm going to go for Hull FC. Uh, Robin, where are you going for this one? I mean, yeah, I could go either way, but um, I, like, I really like this Huddersfield team this year, and I think that they might be like my second team. Well, to be honest, I don't really have a first team. I guess I want, I want, um, I want the uh, French side to do well, but I, I, I like Huddersfield this year, and I'm, I, and so I'm going to pick them because I want them to win. Nice. I want to see them have a good year. Nice, nice, nice. So I'm. So we've only gone. But there's, there's going to be a lot of changes in this league table. There is a chance that Toby does finish top, seeing as we've gone for three, the two different uh, teams. So he could level. The, the only reason you might not be ahead of me, Toby, this week is because I know you're going to pick Lee ahead of Halifax for Game Six, aren't you? <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's an interesting one actually because I was surprised that the wobble Bradford gave Lee on Monday night. Um, Big time. I was really surprised. Um, I think that yeah, there's some something's not quite right in this uh, in this Lee side. Um, I think I mean we saw sort of my favourite, my best mate Caleb Aikins getting a yellow <laughs> card as well, which absolutely broke my heart. Should, should have been a penalty try. Yeah, so there's um, there's some very interesting sort of um, happenings with this Lee squad. Um, but it, yeah, things don't quite make sense, and then I also wonder why. Is it Ben Reynolds? Ben Reynolds, it's, yeah. Um, still, can, it's still at the helm of a team which is made up of players who were playing NRL last season. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's. It, do you know what? This is actually extremely hard for me to call. But as you said, who would I be if I didn't stick with Lee? Who you know, <laughs> they're, they're still on for the title. They're still, they're they're still, still going. For it. Still going for it. Um, yeah. Robin, it's quite obvious who I'm going for here. Like I think to. S- Facts on Premier Sports on a Monday night at the Shea. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go away from them. There's going to the travelling fans are not going to be there for Lee, and I think that the pressure of playing on a horrible pitch uh, on a it's going to be quite warm on Monday, I believe. But Facts gave Fev a, a, some a two decent games over the last um, couple of weekends, so I don't see why Facts can't get the two points here. You're going to who are you backing? Are you backing the Centurions? Or are you going for for the yeah, Panthers? I'm sorry, mate. I think Lee have got this in the bag. I think, um, like Halifax have been very—they've let you down on several occasions they have, this year. They have this year, and there hasn't really been a like shining light yet. Whereas Lee have been pretty consistent. They got off to a slow start against Featherstone, and yeah, they had a bit of a wobble. But I actually back this Lee side now, and so I'm going to join Toby. You're all idiots. You're both idiots. I'll tell you. Uh, no, that's fair. I can see. I can see why you, you're going to go for Lee. I need to back Halifax. I, I didn't. I haven't really backed them a lot this year. I haven't been surprised that we've we've lost games towards the end of the like at the end of games. We've seemed really tired. We need to maybe work on that sort of fitness. And um, the, the the two games against Fev would have really helped. One home, one away, and they've been close. So I can't really knock it. 
but it's been two weeks. I feel like we've we've covered a lot of what we wanted to cover this week. We'll be back in two weeks time, so we'll get more. It's going to be interesting. I should say before we we go, the current um, predictions are: I'm top with thirty points. Rob is second with twenty nine. Toby, you're on twenty eight. We will run predictions in the weeks that we are not live, so keep an eye on social media for those. We will also pick player of the round for weeks we are not live. Um, sorry there wasn't a team of the month last month. Um, we've got one. We had one written down, and we kind of sorted it, but we just didn't publish it. So, But we'll make sure we keep on top of that for every other month. But I've been Bradley. That's been Toby, and that's been a stationary Robin. Um, in post, I will have to add something because you are just buffering the whole time, but we could hear you, so it's good. We will we will fix that. Um, it's it's been the biff. We've been the biff, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Have a have a great one. Don't forget to drop a comment, drop a like, drop a subscription, share, tell us how you're listening, and we'll see you all in a fortnight. Have a good one. <laughs>